Harvard. So uh, he's going to be enlightening us about uh, basics, back to basics with pacemakers, as well as uh, some uh, some troubleshootings. We're looking forward to the conversation. We really appreciate it. And then obviously we have uh, Joey Akuro as well to moderate for uh, any questions you may have. So if anything, shout out in the chat and we appreciate your time today. Great, thanks for having me. And I've shared my screen. I hope you can see it. Is it visible? Yep, it is. Okay, great. And I and I went to full screen. I I hope this is better still. Great. All right. Well, look. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure to join you. And uh, AJ and uh, others and I have, have been working together to try to make additional connections uh, between cardiologists and cardiac electrophysiologists the world over. The hope being that we can all together improve access to care. And I think part of that work involves direct patient impact. Another part involves uh, building bridges and uh, creating more opportunities for collegiality and collaboration uh, among our institutions and among us as individuals. And so I have prepared some slides today that relate to, um, hold on a second, it's not, there we go, uh, that pertain to uh, cardiac device implantation and troubleshooting. And I appreciate that there's a spectrum of roles present on the call. Uh, AJ told me that there are people ranging from uh, people who are assisting in the process to people who are experienced operators. And I've seen a few of the topics that have been presented already, some of which appear to be very specific and very advanced. Part of the goal for today's session is to provide uh, a broader overview that's accessible from a very basic level to make sure that all of us are on the same page on various uh, basic topics in cardiac electrophysiology and device implantation. The thought being that, you know, today's session is not so much a lecture, or at least, you know, anything involving me is not going to be a lecture so much as an opportunity for conversation. So I'd like this to be informal. I'd like all of you to feel free to interrupt me at any point uh, in the conversation to touch upon topics, whether they be basic, advanced, or somewhere in between. So I have some uh, some uh, disclosures here, none of which pertain directly to uh, the content of the talk. And so the goal here uh, for today's session is the following. I was hoping that by the end of the session, all of you feel more comfortable uh, in doing several of the following things. First is stabilizing patients with Brady and or tachyarrhythmias, identifying key resources to assist in device and arrhythmia management, and also to perform basic pacemaker uh, defibrillator troubleshooting, whether you're the implanting physician or not. Um, I apologize, I'm trying to get my screen to cooperate. And so very briefly, in pursuit of these objectives, there's just a few things we're gonna to cover today. First is a few, um, few minutes spent on cardiac electrophysiology and health and disease. Next is a brief primer on pacemaker defibrillator technology. I appreciate that this is gonna be a review for most of you. Uh, next is the bulk of what we, have, uh, we would talk about today, which is uh, troubleshooting. Uh, with um, troubleshooting discussed primarily through the lens of clinical cases, because my goal here is to keep it practical. So just a few minutes about cardiac electrophysiology and health and disease. So you all know this all very well, right? The coordinated co contraction of the heart's chambers is the result of very precise timing of electrical signals throughout the heart, starting through the sinoatrial node, which is kind of like the metronome of the heart, followed by conduction via the atria with coalescence of, a of electrical signals on the AV node, which as you well know, is under ordinary circumstances, the only electrical connection between the upper and lower chambers of the heart, followed by contraction of the ventricles, uh, through conduction via the his Purkinje system. And these different electrical events are manifest, as you well know, uh, with different parts of the tracing on the ECG that we observe. Now, we're talking today because disease of the conduction system ex is exceedingly common. You can have slowed or blocked conduction anywhere within the conduction system, as shown in this diagram, which is a skeletonized view of the heart in which you see the various components of the heart's electrical conduction system with respect to their position uh, according to the uh, coronary arterial tree. Now, generally speaking, uh, conduction system disease can be due to irreversible or reversible causes. 
Irreversible causes include idiopathic age-related progression of fibrosis through the heart, which is inexorable with age, uh, even if a person does not have any clinically manifest conduction or cardiac disease. There's, of course, uh, conduction system diseases in the context of ischemia, or more rarely in the context of infiltrative diseases, such as amyloidosis or sarcoidosis, things that were frankly perceived as being very rare in the past, but something that I think we're seeing more and more of as our appreciation of them increases over time. And then there's also those people who have undergone cardiac surgery for various reasons in whom either the initial process requiring surgery or the surgical procedure itself leads to a disease in the conduction system. There are more rare reversible causes for cardiac conduction system disease, including use of medications or metabolic syndromes, or even uh, inflammatory diseases such as Lyme disease or other rickettsial diseases, for example. And as you all know, uh, conduction system disease that occurs at the level of the compact AV node or above is generally less ominous than conduction system disease that occurs distal to the AV node. So uh, according to the uh, guidelines, if you have evidence of conduction system disease in the SA node or within the compact AV node, the indication for pacemaker implantation is only going to be as strong as the severity of the bradycardia or the severity of the associated patient symptoms, whereas if a person has evidence of conduction system disease distal to the compact AV node, if the, if the issue is irreversible, that person has an indication for pacemaker implantation, even if they have no symptoms. Now, these guidelines pertaining to device implantation are readily available to all of you. And this is a screenshot of a Google search uh, for ACCHA guideline device, just as one example, uh, in which you see that these guidelines documents are readily available to you. You can get the full text for free anytime. But if you're in the throes of uh, dealing with a sick patient, trying to deal with these guidelines, um, is not necessarily practical. It's sort of like reading an encyclopedia. So the goal of today's session is in large part to familiarize you with the physiologic underpinnings of the guidelines so as to make them a bit more accessible to you, even if you already understood, generally speaking, the uh, indications for pacemaker implantation. So as you might guess, uh, deciding on who needs a pacemaker and who doesn't is gonna be based in large part on where the level of block is. And I'm not going to call on people during today's session. I just want to go through a few basic tracings, which I think we're going to be a review for most of the group, um, to uh, just highlight a few basic concepts. So this is a patient in whom sinus rhythm is present. I always start by asking if, I, if sinus rhythm, rhythm is present or not. Here, I believe sinus rhythm is present because I see P waves going all the way across the tracing. For every P wave, there's a QRS. For every QRS, there's a P. Now, there's some variability in the intervals between the P waves. So you have this apparent PAC here, and then sinus bradycardia with smooth uh, variation in the PP intervals across the tracing, with the exception of this one PAC. So certainly this is bradycardia. And if you were to... Uh, be forced to pinpoint one location of block present on this tracing, I would say it's the sinoatrial node um, because you see slowed firing or irregular firing of the sinoatrial node. But aside from that, all distal conduction events appear to be intact and happening on time, meaning the PR intervals on time, the QRS complex is not particularly wide and so forth. And the question is, is this really sinoatrial node uh, block or not? Well, the the morphology that we saw or the findings that we saw in the last ECG are also potentially consistent with issues associated with the autonomic nervous system, meaning the following. As you all well know, uh, the heart rate and blood pressure are sensitive to numerous cues from the central nervous system. Uh, and these signals are mediated through the um, autonomic nervous system with various sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers contacting the heart. Uh, in particular, the ganglionic plexi on the posterior surface of the heart, many of which are directly adjacent to the sinoatrial or the AV node, some of which are, are adjacent to the pulmonary veins on the left and the right side. And these numerous connections, which are as yet poorly understood, modulate heart rate. 
And what you would expect to see uh, with typical neuromodulation of the heart is this smooth change in PP intervals. And sometimes even a change in, in AV intervals, but it's the smoothness that you're looking for. So it could be that in that last tracing I showed you that it was true sinoatrial block, although we really can't rule out the possibility that it's normal sinoatrial node function in the context of additional parasympathetic tone uh, impacting both the sinoatrial and the AV nodes. And here's another tracing in which you see sinus rhythm going across, right? But this time you see evidence of disease within and distal to the compact AV node in that you have a prolonged PR interval here showing you that there's delayed conduction within the compact AV node and you have a markedly widened QRS complex. So you're seeing evidence of disease within the compact AV node and beyond it. But the question is, is that disease relevant to the bradycardia you're seeing? And here, the and I would say not necessarily because you're seeing again sinus rhythm. Every P has a QRS, every QRS has a P, and every every beat has a clear P. And you see this very slow reduction um, in the heart rate, so the the slow prolongation of the PP cycle length with one PVC down here, more consistent with bradycardia modulated by uh, excess parasympathetic tone. So even though this person has a lot of distal conduction system disease, it is not in play clearly uh, in the bradycardia we see on this tracing. So another question here, where's the level of block here? Well, you're seeing evidence of block, you know, again, long PR interval, long QRS complex, right bundle br uh, branch morphology, negative QRS complex and three and a half. So you have right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block. So you've got, what's often called trifascicular block here. So you definitely have distal conduction system disease, but for every P wave, you have a QRS. For every QRS, you have a P. And it's just, well, it's about, you know, a little less than six boxes, about uh, 55, uh, 65 beats per minute here um, on this tracing. So not truly bradycardia. So again, evidence of distal conduction system disease, but not any other... Uh, higher grade AV block, making us suspect that this person might need a pacemaker absent other symptoms or other findings. And so then the next question is, you know, where's the level of block here? Well, again, it's much of the same thing, right? Long PR interval, so disease within the compact AV node, as well as disease distal to the compact AV node, because you have this very wide QRS complex. So within and below the AV node here. And then how about this one? Well, this is a tracing that looks in many respects a lot like the ones we were just looking at, right? So you're seeing P waves going all the way across the tracing, right? Um, and it sure looks like on at first glance, uh, unless you're careful, it may look like every P wave has a QRS and every QRS has a P. But the question I ask you is the following, is there really a consistent relationship between the P waves and the QRS complexes? And upon further inspection, you see that although there's a P wave and there's a QRS following each one, there isn't a consistent relationship between the P and the QRS. And if you were to look all the way across the tracing, you see a progressive shortening of the PR interval as you go all the way across in a way that's uh, constant, suggesting that what you have here is uh, dissociation between the atrium and the ventricles. And you're not seeing uh, a tracing that's consistent with what you might classically consider as being complete heart block, in large part because what you have here is uh, what some will call isorhythmic dissociation, meaning you've got a, a, a PP interval and an RR interval that are very close to one another in cycle length, such that they're kind of just passing each other. Um, and so that you don't have this dramatic disconnect between the atrial rate and the ventricular rate that may make you immediately suspect complete heart block when in fact, that's what this is. This is complete heart block. And so in this patient, you know, just speaking practically, uh, blood pressure is 140 over 80, the person's uh, hemodynamically stable. And this is somebody with known coronary artery disease, preserved ejection fraction, no critical valve disease. And so you're not seeing anything on labs that worries you. So you're thinking, okay, Here's somebody with um, evidence of a non-reversible etiology for their high-grade AV block, uh, 
And this is quite clearly uh, the result of block below the level of the compact AV node. And so all of you, I suspect, would agree that this person is heading towards a permanent pacemaker. Um, but the question is the following, you know, say it's 7 p.m. on Thursday and you know that the EP lab doesn't open up again until 8 a.m. on Friday. And what do you need to do uh, to make sure that this person makes it to get their pacemaker implantation the next day or maybe even a longer wait? What do you do about this wide complex escape? Well, for those people who are hemodynamically stable with a es ventricular escape that is narrow, meaning no evidence of distal conduction system disease. If they're stable, you might consider just watching them and observing them, especially if their heart rates are okay, meaning heart rates in the 40s are faster uh, in anticipation of their permanent pacemaker. But at least at my institution, if somebody has a wide complex escape rhythm, it is the standard for the person to uh, obtain uh, a temporary pacing wire in anticipation of the permanent pacemaker with the knowledge that people in this position, meaning AV dissociation with a wide complex QRS, uh, these folks are by definition more unstable. And uh, these are the types of people who often don't make it uh, to pacemaker implantation. Now, uh, in my experience, I've found that depending upon where you are, it's sometimes the case that uh, folks who are in this position are lost because of longer waits required for pacemaker implantation. And it may even be that the person is being cared for in a place where temporary pacing is not available or that temporary pacing is just not practical uh, because if the wait for pacemaker implantation is more than just hours or days, it may not make sense to attempt uh, temporary pacing wire implantation. And so uh, the question is then, is there any medical therapy that might help? Well, if the person's on an AV nodal blocker, you wouldn't give it to them, right? You'd hold it. And there are some other medications you can give, including potentially atropine or isoproterenol or dopamine as intravenous drips. Know that these medications can help in many cases, but it's important to keep in mind that the segment of the conduction system disease where the block is occurring here, notably distal to the AV node, these areas are notoriously insensitive to atropine and isoproterenol, and to some extent also to dopamine, such that uh, although it may not hurt you to give these medications, it may not be realistic to expect that they're gonna help much either. And so that's that's the sort of primer about um, conduction system disease leading to bradyarrhythmias. Regarding the substrate for ventricular arrhythmias, uh, know that it's fibrosis that increases the likelihood of ventricular arrhythmias, whether you have a depressed left ventricular ejection fraction or a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. These diagrams are um, stained sections of the ventricle taken in the short axis as seen in this right upper panel here, in which you see the wall of the ventricle and the endocardial surface at the top, epicardial surface at the bottom, in which you see normal myocardium uh, stained dark, and you see scar tissue stained light. And in people who have scarring, it's not that you have homogeneous uh, pieces of scar that exist as a piece of marble, so to say, in the heart, rather you've got this interdigitation of diseased and viable myocardium leading to areas of slowed conduction. And it's that anisotropy or the adjoining areas of uh, tissue that conduct at normal speed versus delay speeds that create the possibility of having a reentrant circuit, which then can be the substrate for ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And know that this fibrosis is the, it's the end pathway of all etiologies of congestive heart failure, whether it's ischemic or non-ischemic, and whether you have a preserved ejection fraction or not. And obviously, something very similar is happening in those people with infiltrative heart disease as well. So this is really what's happening for ventricular arrhythmias. And because this substrate is not necessarily fully reversible or addressable in large part with medications, uh, we often talk of defibrillator implantation in such patients uh, so as to provide 
timely uh, restoration of normal rhythm should they have a ventricular arrhythmia. And again, generally speaking, uh, for primary prevention, you qualify for an ICD if your ejection fraction is 35% or less with New York Heart Association class two or, or worse. Um, or uh, you would qualify for secondary prevention uh, ICD, no matter what your ejection fraction is, if you've had uh, sustained ventricular tachycardia or an aborted cardiac arrest uh, in a situation where the etiology is non-reversible. So, and this is what we're seeking to prevent, right? Here's a, here's a patient I cared for in the CCU at the Mass General in whom uh, sinus rhythm was present, present with a very markedly prolonged QT interval. This is some of the very advanced ischemic cardiomyopathy and you add some PVCs, here's an R on T event. So you have a long short leading to initiation of VF. And you see just how quickly the patient's pulse seen on the uh, associated arterial line tracing goes to nothing uh, within you know two seconds of initiation of the arrhythmia. So this is what the, the defibrillator is all about. It's all about timing, as you all know. Uh, the faster you defibrillate, the more likely it is that the person survives. So enough about cardiac electrophysiology and health and disease. I wanted to get into a brief primer on pacemaker and defibrillator technology for just a few minutes. So as you very well know, the basic pacing system is comprised of four basic parts. There's the pulse generator, which contains the computing system and the system for pacing and sensing, uh, as well as the battery. And then there's the leads, which attach the pulse generator to the heart. You know, in this in this case, I'm I'm showing you a dual chamber system, uh, knowing full well that the number of leads per system will vary from one to three. You've got the patient care system as well, meaning the programmer, right, which communicates wirelessly with the system that allows for sensing of parameters, assessment of structural integrity of the system, as well as uh, giving the operator the the capability of reprogramming as needed. And of course, last and most importantly, there's the patient. Here's just a few examples of, of pulse generators that you've seen. Here's a single chamber Ella pacemaker system. Here's a CRTD system from Boston Scientific. And here's a, a loop recorder uh, from Medtronic. This is just some examples, knowing full well that this is an older generation of a loop recorder. Most of the ones being implanted these days are a bit smaller than this. And I just have a few x-rays here just to uh, orient you to the basic finding you should expect to see. Generally speaking, the uh, loop recorder should be present to the left of the sternum, more or less over left, the left atrium. Of course, placement varies, but I think the best place for these things is generally over the left atrium because even though you're often looking for a total uh, a magnitude of electrograms to be sensed by the device, typically the, the lowest electrogram, but the one that's the most meaningful is the atrial electrogram, right? Because you're often looking for AFib in these folks. And unless you've got the, the device placed over the atrium, you're going to be less likely to sense atrial signals effectively. Here's a single chamber pacemaker implanted in a that I implanted in a patient immediately after they had complete heart block following a TAVR. So here's the TAVR, the aortic valve um, device. And here's the, the single chamber system with the lead um, implanted in the apex of the right ventricle. And uh, just a very brief primer on anatomy. So I think of the RV as being like an equilateral triangle sitting on the diaphragm. And so the RV apex really should not be anywhere close to uh, the left heart border because much of the left heart border is defined by the left ventricle. So if you happen to see an RV lead all the way out towards uh, the, uh, the true left heart border. And, and if you can confirm that the heart is not rotated, you have to have concern that that lead has perforated uh, and is actually out into the pericardial space. Here's a dual chamber system in another patient in which you see the atrial lead, which again is sitting in the right atrial appendage. And this lead is curving out of the plane of the x-ray towards us, right? Sitting on the roof of the right atrium. And here's the right ventricular lead once again, uh, with the RV being an equilateral triangle sitting flat on the um, on the diaphragm. And so here's the lead uh, close to the apex of the RV. Here's an ICD lead. The easiest way to, to distinguish 
uh, a pacemaker lead from an ICD lead is the presence of the high voltage conductor, which is very bright on the X-ray as compared to the pacing lead. Here's an older system in which you have um, high voltage conductors, not just in the uh, right ventricle, but also in the superior vena cava. These days we've largely moved away from the SVC conductor systems. Um, and here's the pulse generator, which is considerably larger in the ICD than in a pacemaker. Here's a biventricular system, uh, biventricular ICD, in which you see uh, the right atrium and right ventricular leads uh, in the, uh, oops, sorry. I'm gonna try to go backwards. Uh, the right atrial lead and the roof of the right atrial appendage. Uh, and here you see the RV lead and the distal RV septum. And here you see the um, the LV lead in the coronary sinus. And here you see the very posterior takeoff of the coronary sinus with posterior deflection. And this is um, uh, a lateral branch of the coronary sinus in which the, the LV lead is sitting. And so those are the some of the most common uh, systems that you will be experiencing and, uh, and their relative locations in the heart under ordinary circumstances. There's of course the di device programming nomenclature with which all of you are undoubtedly familiar. Uh, now this, this is a nomenclature that refers to the functions of the device, including pacing, sensing, and response to sensing. So that VVI, AAI, DDD, these, these, um, these acronyms that you're used to seeing really refer to pacing, sensing, and response to pacing, uh, response to sensing. There are some additional uh, programming functions, which are um, uh, these these uh, different categories are not used quite as often anymore. The fourth category uh, is often used to refer to um, rate responsiveness of a device. So you have somebody who's pacing in both chambers, sensing in both chambers, um, and you've got a response to sensing, whether it's, you know, let's say inhibition or triggering uh, in both chambers, that'll be somebody who with DDD pacing. And if there's a rate responsiveness algorithm that's been activated in that system, it'll be DDDR. This fifth category is not really used very often anymore because people typically described uh, tachyarrhythmia um, programming separate to bradyarrhythmia uh, programming and the atrial burst pacing that was at one time uh, discussed for use of treatment of atrial arrhythmias has largely fallen by the wayside. So really you're just gonna see these four, first four categories described, not the fifth. And so with that, uh, I'd like to move forward now with our, uh, our final uh, objective of the day, which is to go over some uh, troubleshooting of devices. Uh, and I think the start of that is undoubtedly uh, a basic understanding of what the what the behavior of a pacer would look like in different modes. So again, I'm not going to try to call on people here, um, but if any of you has thoughts or questions about any of these tracings, please don't hesitate to just speak up. Uh, and interrupt me um, if as we go through. So going from left to right in this uh, rhythm strip, you see a large vertical spike followed by a wide complex, which appears to be a, a QRS complex just based on its um, amplitude and the presence of what looks like a T wave afterwards, right? And this tall spike, you know, sure doesn't look physiologic, right? And the, and the tracing here is not terribly well uh, visible all the way across the tracing. Uh, and part of the reason is that um, I've taken these tracings from uh, one of my mentors. His name is Warren Hawthorne, and these are from like the 1980s. And it's not always the case that we see good examples of, of these tracings anymore. And so I just, I took the best ones I could find, many of which are quite old. Uh, because these days, most devices are programmed to avoid some of the things that we're going to look at here. So anyway, so you've got this non-physiologic spike followed by what appears to be a QRS complex. Then you see this hairline trace that's in time 
with the interval between these non-physiologic spikes from before, but you see a different QRS complex and you see that the QRS complex starts a little bit just before the pacing spike comes in. Here, the next thing you see is a native looking QRS complex followed by a pacing spike. And then you see another native complex coming in before the next pacing spike. And as you see here, the RR interval between these native complexes is consistent and there's no change in the timing of this non-physiologic spike, which is, as you all have guessed by now, the pacing spike. And you see the QRS complex coming in. And then finally, uh, the pacing spike comes in soon enough so that the ventricle is no longer refractory as it was in these complexes, right? And it once again captures the ventricle, and then you're back to ventricular pacing across the tracing. So, of course, I, you know, I, I, uh, uh, I advanced a little bit too soon just a few moments ago, but I'm sure you all guessed that this is VOO or asynchronous ventricular pacing with a, na with a native competing rhythm, meaning the following. So you've got clear capture every time the device uh, uh, fires uh, and the ventricle is not refractory, you see capture. So there's no obvious reason uh, for failure to capture here, but there's a few non-conducted pacing spikes um, that we believe are non-conducted just because they're occurring on the refractory period of the ventricle. And obviously the RR interval for, or the pacing uh, interval does not change in any way, indicating that it has not changed it with response to ventricular sensing. So pacing V, sensing no, response to sense no. So VOO. How about here? Well, very similar situation where you have pacing going across the tracing. Once again, the pacing is not as obvious to see because uh, this is an old uh, photocopy uh, from many years ago, but you see that there's a pacing spike happening across the tracing at about 60 beats per minute going all the way across. Pacing uh, intervals never changes when you go across. Occasionally you see evidence of a pacing spike followed by what appears to be a P wave and then a PR interval that's fairly constant after that. And there's a few examples. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. So every time the pacing happens, it appears to capture the atrium and then the ventricular conduction happens spontaneously afterwards. You've got some places where the pacing appears to be happening on top of the QRS complex or at other times with no response. It doesn't, it doesn't lead to any other change in either the PP interval uh, or uh, in the uh, PR interval. And here you've got some evidence of what appears to be native sinus rhythm that happens to be coming in a little bit faster than the pacing spike. So this is the atrial analog to the last tracing in which we're seeing atrial asynchronous uh, pacing with intermittent capture of the atrium and a competing native rhythm that's just a little bit faster than the paced uh, rate. Dr. Matazic, just to- Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to jump in here, on, I think the ventricular example is maybe a little better of this, but whenever you hear the term functional loss of capture, this is to the group, um, this would be you know, what they're referring to there is where the, the device is, it's not captured as a function of the fact that you know the, the, the tissue is in refractory. Um, there's not an issue with the pacemaker itself not being able to capture. Um, functionally, at least. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really good um, it's a really good point. I have to admit, I I personally prefer uh, to avoid functional loss of capture as a term to avoid uh, confusion. And we're also going to go over some examples a little later on of uh, circumstances in which there's failure to capture and circumstances where there's just no excuse for it. So an indicator that, you know, the device is not functioning properly, hence the troubleshooting title of the talk. But yeah, thanks for making that, that, um, that point. It's a really, it's a really important one. The difference between capture that doesn't happen because it's physiologic or capture that doesn't happen because of a problem with the device. Um, so how about pacing modes here? Well, just going across, you know, it looks like there's, sinus rhythm here, right? It's not atrial fibrillation. You've got P waves followed by QRS. Every time you have a P, there's a QRS. Every time you have a QRS, there's a P. 
And for many of the P waves, there's a non-physiologic signal just upstream of it. Again, something that doesn't really come through as well on this reproduction, which is quite old. Um, but uh, but you see here this non-physiologic signal, which is clearly just a pacing spike. So you have pacing, atrial signal followed by a native QRS, pacing, atrial signal followed by a native QRS, pacing, atrial signal followed by a native QRS. Same thing, pacing, atrial signal followed by a native QRS. Here's a native P wave that comes in a little bit earlier. You know, the cycle length here is a little bit shorter than that of the pacing cycle length and followed by the native QRS. Here's another beat that comes in a little bit earlier. This one I think would qualify as being a PAC uh, where you have a PR interval that's just a little bit longer uh, followed by a QRS. And again, here uh, you're, you're seeing this native activity with no pacing spikes coming through, right? So it looks like, you know, when the person comes in and conducts on their own or fires on their own, the device stands by. And here you have resumption of atrial pacing, native P wave, QRS, same thing. Pacing the A, native QRS, pacing the A, native QRS. On the bottom tracing, I'm not really seeing much evidence of P wave. Of course, there's a lot of baseline artifact here. There may be some places where there, there's a little bit of a P wave, but it's not continuous. So it's a little bit tougher to call this truly sinus rhythm, but in any event, you're seeing in, in places this low amplitude, relatively narrow complex that's consistent with the QRS complex, right? And in those cases, just a little bit faster than what you're seeing in these cases where you have a non-physiologic signal followed by a wide QRS complex indicating ventricular pacing. And here's just a little bit slower than the native rhythm. But in these cases where you have the native beats, unlike the tracings we looked at earlier, you're not seeing an attempt by the system to pace through it, right? So anytime the person comes in on their own, the device is standing by. And here you see that, you know, the interval from here to this pacing spike, well, it's identical to the RR interval in pacing. So it looks like it just timed out and started pacing. And here you come in again with native. So here are atrial and ventricular uh, examples of appropriate inhibition pacing, meaning you're pacing in one chamber. Here it's atrial pacing, atrial sensing, and inhibition in response to native conduction. And here's the ventricular example, ventricular sensing, vent rather ventricular pacing, ventricular sensing, and inhibition with response to native uh, signals. What's this now? So once again, old tracing, um, in which you see a non-physiologic signal, you know, this, this has no business, uh, being associated with any true physiologic impulse. So this is like a square wave effectively. So this sure looks like a pacing spike, just one that didn't come through on the screen very well. But every time you see, uh, this pacing spike, you see apparent capture of the ventricle and that's very consistent all the way across the tracing. But the question I have for the group is, why is there this notch in the ST segment? What do you think that is? Retrograde conduction. Yeah, that's exactly right. And like I said at the beginning, I appreciate that a lot of, if not most of what I'm talking about today is going to be a review for the group. And the goal for today is to make sure that everybody in all roles has access to content that um, they can engage with. And so for those of you who already know, Hopefully uh, this is a, a useful review and certainly we can do more advanced topics on, on more specific things later on, but that's exactly right. This is ventricular pacing with very consistent retrograde atrial conduction uh, in which you see a negative P wave because the P wave is conducting away from uh, the location in which this uh, signal is being sensed. So here is an example of rate responsiveness in the context of ventricular pacing. So here's somebody in whom, you know, there's really not an obvious P wave here. There may be some evidence of P wave here and there, but really what we're focusing on here is the fact that you've got a pacing spike followed by a wide complex uh, QRS going across uh, consistent with ventricular pacing. And you see that the rate here is approximately 75 beats per minute. 
and you see this smooth increase in the rate, right? So you gradually go to go to, you know, uh, approximately 100 beats per minute from 75. So this smooth transition indicates not a malfunction of the device or sensing from above, especially in the absence of an obvious P wave here, but rather this is what you would expect to see with rate responsiveness, whether it's uh, a thoracic impedance monitor or an accelerometer, both of which are present in various manifestations of pacemakers that you'll that you'll have experience with. So there was, you know, when I first prepared um, this talk, there were only a few MR permissible devices. They were in the early days, Biotronic and Medtronic. These days, um, uh, all manufacturers uh, have uh, MRI conditional systems, but just keep in mind that depending upon the era in which a pacemaker was implanted, depending upon the pulse generator or the leads that were used, you may or may not have an MRI conditional system. Uh, and just keep this in mind. And I think the best way to, a, to assess whether or not a system is MRI conditional is if there's any doubt, reach out to a local representative, give them the model numbers of all the components of the system and ask them. And then of course, you know, do, a, do an interrogation to confirm that all integrity checks are within acceptable limits because that's critical as well. Uh, most of the time you can find this information online, meaning if you find a model number on an interrogation, you'll be able to look it up on the manufacturer website and figure out whether or not it's MRI conditional. But again, if there's any doubt uh, about any part of it, I think it's always worthwhile to reach out um, to a representative to be sure. And so now that we've gone over a little bit about basic function of a pacemaker and a defibrillator, why it would go in and what some of the Brady pacing modes would be and some of the things to look for on ECGs in the context of normal function of the systems. Uh, I'd like to now use the remaining time and we only have about 10 minutes left in the hour, although I'm happy to stay longer for those of you uh, who are available. Um, I want to talk about some cases in which we do some troubleshooting. So here I will pause uh, to, to see what members of the group think. Um, so here we have a tracing in which we see ventricular pacing on the left side of the tracing, right? And here we do see evidence of a P wave that's coming through. But again, like that tracing we showed at the very beginning, you see what appears to be isorhythmic dissociation between the P wave and the QRS suggesting that this is somebody with sinus rhythm in whom it's a single chamber system, right? Because you're pacing the ventricle um, and um, it's not pacing throughout. So it's clearly not asynchronous, right? So you're pacing and sensing in the ventricle, but it's not in hit, in, um, uh, but it's, but it's not clearly asynchronous and there's no evidence of uh, synchronization of A and V here. So you've got ventricular pacing going across and then it, the pacing just stops, right? And the, the stoppage of the pacing is associated with the presence of this fuzzy noise on the tracing. Then the fuzzy noise goes away and you have resumption of pacing. So what do you think? What's happening? So this is something that uh, you need to you need to keep your eyes out for, and that is uh, the presence of electromagnetic interference that can inhibit pacing because these this uh, fuzzy noise leads to uh, signals of an amplitude that may not be very high by your eye or my eye, but it may be sufficient to be sensed as a ventricular electrogram or a ventricular or or an electrical signal which the pacemaker's programming interprets as being a natively conducted beat. So it pauses on pacing. And this is a surface ECG, mind you. So this is not an intracardiac electrogram. This is not uh, information we're getting from the device itself. So this is not necessarily noise from the lead per se. This is noise somewhere in the environment of the room, 
right? And so some other equipment or who knows what. But this is, you know, again, ventricular pacing, uh, V-lead only. It's not asynchronous. And when it sees this signal, which is we see as noise, but the device is interpreting as being native uh, electrical activity leading to appropriate inhibition of the signal. So what is it? It's a VVI pacing uh, that's inhibited due to electromagnetic interference from somewhere in the environment. Uh, one thing that, so in the chat, someone had pointed out uh, magnet or, or MRI. So I think you could maybe, like MRI could make some sort of noise inhibition, but a, a magnet itself on a pacemaker would actually cause it to pace at the magnet mode, just for clarification. So a, a normal magnet activity of a pacemaker is to pace at um, a rate indicating the battery asynchronously, which is actually a way that you can ensure a patient gets support while you're doing surgery, if you're using any kind of electric artery or bovine. But uh, an MRI machine itself, uh, Dr. Tazik, I'm sure you could probably expand on this, can cause inhibition. It can, yes. Well, I'll put it this way: MRI can cause all sorts of things because, again, when you're when you're an MR, when your body is in an MR scanner, you're not just exposed to the uh, the magnetic field. As you know, uh, the scans are uh, are the result of sensing that follows by perturbation of the magnetic field, uh, meaning you've got the magnetic field that's that's going. It's continuous, but then you've got radio waves that are intermittently firing that perturb the magnetic field. And it's that perturbation that leads to enough of a change in spin that's then, you know, uh, that's then uh, read off as resonance, right? Magnetic resonance. Um, and so your pacemaker can be thrown off by all sorts of things. So the magnet itself is enough to just put you in an asynchronous mode, but all the other electronic equipment in the room, including the generator for radio frequency and just the power source for the thing, et cetera, all that's gonna create so much noise that it's the EMI from the scanner uh, that you're dealing with for the most part. That's distinct from the magnet that you would place on a device, right? Because as again, I'll get to this a little later on, but as you all will know, there are manufactured magnets that you can place over the device that will flip a, 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 a ferromagnetic switch inside the generator and will switch it into an asynchronous mode. But that's just the magnetic field. That's no other EMI, right? So that's the difference between putting a magnet on the site versus being inside the magnet of an MR scanner. I hope that that, that clarifies that point. That was perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So um, again, the question I'm asking with all these tracings is just what is that? Because let's face it, you know, when all of us are going through our days clinically, you know, what's happening to us? You know, we're walking around, we're, we're minding our own business and somebody walks up to us and puts a puts a tracing in our face and says, what's this? Tell me what to do. <laughs> or at least that's what happens to me. Um, so I think it's most helpful to just go through these tracings as unknowns, right? And just kind of go through the steps of analyzing them. Uh, Cause again, my hope is that through, um, through uh, ongoing review of these types of tracings, uh, the people in the audience who are less experienced will in time uh, not only become more experienced, but more able to kind of go through the, the steps of analysis. So, all right, so what's this? Well, okay, going across from the top, and here's four different leads. And again, four different leads, but they're not uh, in time with one another. So it's sort of like continuous uh, switching between leads. And again, this is a really old tracing. Uh oh, sorry about that. Uh, really old um, tracing taken from a time at MGH when EKGs were performed by uh gathering electrical signals on each of the different leads individually on different channels so the operator would get an, get a tracing on the paper for one channel cut the piece of paper out switch to the next channel cut the paper out switch to the next channel cut the paper out 
And then they paste it all together on a formatted piece of paper to make the 12 lead. So it's like a collage. Uh, so these are the different components of the collage. This sort of speaks to the age of the tracings that I'm giving you. Just, and again, I'm using the old ones just because they're just the best ones that I could find to demonstrate these principles. So here's evidence of ventricular pacing, right? Pacing spike, in large QRS complex. Maybe there's a P wave in there, but it's not clearly synchronous, right? And then you got a little bit of noise here. Who knows what that is? That kind of square wave there. It could be just somebody like flicking the wire with their finger or who knows what it is, but um, there's no like EMI like we saw in the last tracing. The baseline is pretty, is pretty clean. And it's a thicker baseline just because in that era, that's just how they looked. Um, it's sort of a wider pen that would uh, go across the paper. So ventricular pacing, and here's a pacing spike, but nothing happened right? And there's no native anything. There's no native P wave, QRS, no nothing. Um, so why did this one not capture? Well, it didn't really have an excuse to capture, right? As distinct from the tracings we looked at before, it's not like there's a native complex around. It's not like this is pacing within the refractory period from the ventricle, right? It's been a while since the last pacing spike. So when I see this kind of thing, I immediately get suspicious that it's just failure to capture. You know, the device is doing what it's supposed to do, like it's coming in on time, right? Uh, this this interval between pacing spikes, this is the same as the one as it was when it was capturing. It just didn't capture this time. Then you've got some capturing. This QRS complex looks a little different from that one. I, I suspect because there's fusion between a native beat and the pace beat here, um, maybe because this is just the timing of the patient's inherent escape rhythm, right? And it just collided with um, the, the actual successful pacing spike. Then you got some more pacing spikes. You got another one that didn't come in. Here's a, here's a native escape, it seems. Here's another beat that didn't uh, conduct. Again, you can make an argument that maybe this was refractory, but boy, it certain, certainly is a long time, right, for it to be refractory. Another, another pa successful pacing event, another failed pacing event. And as we go across the tracing, we're seeing a lot of evidence of these pacing spikes in the open, so to speak. You know, it's not like they're on top of any native signals. There's no reason that you can see why these wouldn't have conducted, meaning it's not pacing on a refractory period and there's no evidence of EMI, right? That might've legitimately inhibited ventricular pacing. So what is it? Well, it's what I showed you already when I when I clicked ahead. It's ventricular pacing with intermittent failure to capture because there's no uh, physiologic or other environmental reason that we could use to explain absence of, of successful pacing. How about this? Well, all right, we got sinus rhythm, right? You got a P wave, you got a QRS complex, but it looks like you've got a P wave and then a pacing spike followed by a QRS complex. And so that's sinus rhythm with, so atrial sensing ventricular pacing. Then you've got atrial sensing, and it looks like there's an attempt in ventricular spike, but nothing happened, right? Then you've got atrial pacing followed by ventricular pacing, ventricular, and then atrial sensing, and nothing happens. Then you have atrial pacing, ventricular pacing, atrial sensing, nothing happens, A pace, V pace, and then A pace, V pace. Then again, atrial sen, and then atrial uh, P wave. I shouldn't say atrial sensing. I apologize. I misspoke. You have a P wave, no obvious response from the device. And it paces the A immediately afterward anyway. And when you have pacing of the A, you have pacing of the V. So what's happening? Well, this is apparent failure to sense in a DDD pacemaker because you've got these P waves, right? That are not being sensed by the device and it's coming in and pacing immediately afterwards. How about here? Now, this is distinct from the other tracings I showed you earlier. Everything else I showed you to this point was uh, a surface tracing. So the kind of thing you would see if you did a 12 lead ECG or if you're looking on telemetry, for example. Uh, here, I'm using data from uh, a programmer. You know, the wireless uh, 
the wireless interrogation performed with the bedside device. And here uh, we're seeing, just to orient everybody in the audience, we're seeing signals, uh, a surface uh, uh, signal as well as uh, an intracardiac signal. And again, the surface signal here is not one that truly comes from the surface, but one that is an extrapolated surface signal generated by the data acquired from the intracardiac pacing leads. So you, and then below it, you see uh, the events, right? Um, meaning uh, the different channels, you've got the atrial channel and the ventricular channel, and uh, the device is telling you by the labeling here what it thinks it's seeing. You know, it thinks it sees an atrial event, or and it also tells you when it's pacing, right? VP is pace, ventricular pacing, AP is atrial pacing, AS is atrial sensing, VS is ventricular sensing. And we're not seeing the the atrial lead data on a separate channel up top. We're really just seeing the ventricular data. But the main point of this of this tracing is to just show you that you've got these complexes going across that sure look like QRS complexes, right? And they line up with what appears to be ventricular sensing on the channel that shows you the device's interpretation. And this is representative of noise, meaning you've got areas here where you've got ventricular sensing, um, and you've got this very sharp, non-physiologic looking signals uh, leading to evidence of some inappropriate atrial or apparently inappropriate atrial sensing as well as ventricular sensing on the channel. Uh, and this is what noise would look like. And again, you're seeing non-physiologic uh, signals, meaning variable wavelengths, variable amplitudes, uh, and shapes of electrograms that are not what you would expect to see uh, from the cardiac conduction system. So here's a lot of noise on the lead that's leading to some inhibition of pacing in some cases. Um, because you're you're getting a lot of inappropriate sensing. So I showed you an example earlier about electromagnetic interference in the room that was leading to appropriate um, uh, inhibition of pacing per the programming of the device. Here you're seeing inhibition of pacing by the device that is a function of noise that's being generated by the pacing system itself. And it's often the case that this is a result of a break in either the insulation of the lead or a break in the conductor, or sometimes even a, a, a break in communication between the lead, the end of the lead or the pin and the header of the pulse generator. All these things are possible. Sometimes you'll see this kind of noise that's intermittent um, and one test you can do at the bedside to see is, is to see if it's due to uh, a conductor break uh, or an insulation break is to do the following. While you're doing the wireless interrogation of the device, you can put your hand on the generator and move it around in the pocket. And it may be that you recreate some of this noise that was being seen. And you know this type of noise is very dangerous to a patient because it can do several things. First is it can inhibit pacing. And for somebody who's pacemaker dependent, that 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 interference can lead to asystole. And again, I showed you that on the, on the EMI tracing earlier, right? There's somebody who had no underlying ventricular rate. And the, when the EMI came in, the pacing stopped and the person had effectively no underlying rhythm. You can have the same thing occurring from noise from uh, the lead and uh, again, if you have a lot of um, uh oh, if you have a lot of noise coming in on a ventricular channel in somebody with an ICD in place, that can be interpreted as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, leading to a potentially inappropriate shock. And as many of you are sure, uh, I'm sure are aware, there was even a uh, uh, an example with one of the manufacturers, there's a, is Medtronic and it was their Fidelis lead uh, 
you know, approximately uh, you know, a little over 15 years ago, where um, a lot of people were coming in with failures of the conductors on these leads, and they're having a lot of inappropriate shocks by the devices, so, uh, leading to requirement that the lead be, you know, the, first that the uh, tachytherapies on the device be inactivated, and then to have the ventricular lead either replaced or extracted and then replaced. So again, just to summarize what we're seeing here, this is just another, another version of um, interference with ordinary programming of the system. Again, not because of an external source of uh, electromagnetic radiation, but rather due to conduct and conductor failures or other connection failures within the system. Again, with the three main players being conductor, conductor failure, insulation failure, or a problem with communication between the lead and the pulse generator inside the header. And uh, Dr. Tassik, do you mind staying on that one just a second? What's that? Do you mind going back to that uh, to that image? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Quick. So yeah. Um, this is kind of an interesting example. Um, so this is an Avid device, I would say. It's an older one, but it looks like the Avid layout here. And mm -hmm. uh, for the people here looking at the bottom rhythm strip on the marker channel, where it says VSS or VSP, that if you were to actually change the sweep speed of it, it would say VSVS or VSVP. So if you see here, there's noise on the atrial channel. The device goes into a mode switch mode, which is uh, a dual chamber mode switch mode. So the AMS on the marker channel means um, auto mode switch. So the device is now in the uh, mode switch mode. You'll see it faces, and it happens to the atrial face aligns with the uh, ventricular event, which is being sensed on the atrial channel. The device is seeing this event and thinking what I imagine the device is doing. I, I can't actually read its mind as an older device. But it seems to be interpreting this as possible crosstalk, and as a uh, a defense of risk of having no um, backup pacing if the patient were to you know have no induction, right? If it thinks it's crosstalk, it's going to have a backup or safety pace 50 milliseconds after the uh, detected new sense. So this is a functional crosstalk detection. So it's not the kind of noise emission on the ventricular channel. It's not over sensing atrial noise. It's actually just happening to align an atrial pace with a true ventricular event, at least a fine interpretation of it, causing it to uh, to safety pace as a result. Uh, the reason why it's such a short window there is to avoid any kind of pacing in T waves. You see where it's a pacing, it's, it's aligning with the QRS complex. I mean, like there could be some vulnerable pacing here, and I'm not an electrophysiologist, but um, it's kind of a defense mechanism of the device to avoid um, holding a ventricular pace. And in those cases, when the patient is independent, that can be very dangerous. So. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's, that's the more advanced um, interpretation here. I was choosing to focus on <laughs> just the basic consequences <laughs> of noise, uh, meaning there's, it has consequences for bradyarrhythmia pacing as well as for tachy programming. You're right to point out safety pacing, which can happen in, in response to noise on some of these systems. But again, depending upon where the issue is, you can't necessarily bank on that stepping in, uh, and depending upon the generation of the device and the manufacturer, et cetera. So, uh, so thank you very much for, for including that. It's extremely helpful and good for everyone to know. But I guess uh, if I had to have one takeaway from this, it would be that if you see noise on either the atrial or the ventricular channel, you need to be investigating um, uh, what you're going to do about that apparent failure in the conductor. You know, the first the first course of action is to make sure that it's not uh, due to external electromagnetic interference. Now, sometimes you're, you're seeing these kinds of things on an interrogation for somebody who comes in uh, for just their annual checks for a pacemaker, for example, right? And you're and you're seeing some of these alerts, and they and then sometimes they'll cluster around certain times. And again, if you're seeing this person in the office, you're not seeing the surface ECGs, right? You're not getting a sense of whether or not um, this noise occurred. Uh, 
due to an external or an internal source. Now I have I have future uh, sessions that I could devote to how you would go about doing that. Uh, so if you were to see noise that's simultaneous on both atrial and ventricular channels, and if you could ascribe it to certain external events, like, you know, it'll give you a timestamp on the device. And if the person says, oh yes, I was working on an electrical generator that day, or I was arc welding that day. You, and if all the other parameters on your device look good and if you manipulate the device in the pocket and nothing happens, you might say, okay, I have reason to suspect that this was, that this noise that was uh, sensed was more likely to be due to an environmental issue rather than being an issue with the, with the device itself. You can say that. Whereas if you see localized noise on only one lead, and if it's not clearly associated with any environmental stimulus per the patient, and if you're able to recapitulate some of that noise by manipulating the system in the pocket, that that speaks very strongly to um, this being noise due to a conductor failure or some other mechanical issue with the system itself. And the main point here is just that uh, when you have a problem with the system like that, there's no way to program around it effectively. The, the, the lead's got to be replaced. And I think that's the thing. So if you see this kind of noise that you really think is due to the lead itself, and if you can really rule out an environmental stimulus, you need to start uh, planning immediately for lead replacement. And it often means that you're not letting that patient out of your sight until you can perform the definitive fix. So, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for bringing up that, that interpretation of uh, safety pacing. It's important. And I think we can get into uh, more advanced uh, aspects of this uh, in later sessions. But um, very briefly, I've got some additional materials here. And, and, and with respect to time, I don't think we've got the ability to go over all these things because it's already 14 minutes after the hour. And I want to be respectful of all of your time, but um, very briefly, just a word on magnetic or uh, magnet placement. It'll facilitate a battery check. It's often used during surgery to protect from inhibition of pacing from cautery, which is another you know very common source of electromagnetic interference. And when the magnet is there, you get that asynchronous pacing like we were talking about, as distinct from what's happening when you're in an MRI scanner in which you're getting all sorts of other sort of EMI. And you should also remember that the pacing rate can be an indicator of battery life. So when the, per when the person reaches elective replacement interval, the rate will switch to a different base rate, which is distinct for all the different manufacturers. And this is something you can look up. So if you see a very specific non-physiologic heart rate, like 72 beats per minute or 75 or 80 or something like this, you can look up uh, what the manufacturer's ERI rate is and see if that's where you are, even if you can't uh, interrogate the device with a programmer yourself. Um, and it's often the case that use of a magnet is needed uh, in certain surgical situations to protect the patient from asystole uh, and so forth. And, um, Again, same thing in defibrillators. It's not. It's not just that you're using a magnet to uh, bring up asynchronous pacing with a defibrillator. You could also use it to uh, inhibit shocks. Because, like I said, not only can that electromagnetic interference inhibit necessary pacing, but it can also be sensed by devices being VT and VF and lead to inappropriate shocks. So that magnet can help prevent inappropriate cautery-related shocks in the context of surgery. Just something to keep in mind. Um, and again, know that there are several examples. And again, every manufacturer's had an issue over the years. Uh, but just be, be aware that there are certain leads out there that have been associated with a higher frequency of problems. These are long since off the market. But you may encounter a patient with a legacy device in which you need to be ready for this kind of thing always be ready to reach out to your local representative for any manufacturer in which you have concern about lead malfunction. 
And as was pointed out earlier by AJ, you know, all manufacturers have installed software safeguards intended to uh, produce alerts before the person gets appropriate shocks in these cases for, for, for Abbott and for Medtronic in these cases, and also have their other uh, software checks that will help prevent inappro uh, inappropriate inhibition of pacing uh, in a lot of these examples, like safety pacing and the rest. Um, and again, in terms of placing of the magnet, know that you shouldn't put it directly over the device. You should put a little bit off to the side, either above or below the generator. And don't just assume it's going to stay there. Secure it very carefully with a piece of tape because you don't want this thing sliding around uh, and failing to do what it's there to do during a surgical procedure, for example. Um, and I don't have much time left here, but just a few words about clinical cases just two cases to show you. First is be ready for atypical lead placement. Like I showed you in the very beginning, you know, uh, if you see an RV lead that looks like it's all the way out uh, at the left heart border or beyond, be very mindful that the, that lead may have perforated. But every now and again, you have to be aware that sometimes atypical lead placement is um, uh, expected based on a person's anatomy. So here's a device I implanted in somebody who had had a, a total left-sided uh, luminectomy and um, movement of the left-sided diaphragm such that uh, the stomach was where the heart was supposed to be. And the heart was basically in the left, mid and upper lobe locations for the lung. So here uh, in the in the lateral view, you're seeing the orientation of the atrial and ventricular leads that you would expect to see if you're looking AP. So this is somebody with a heart that's completely moved over and rotated to the left. But this is just where the atrium and the ventricle were in this guy's case. Um, and so, so just be ready for that, especially in people with congenital abnormalities. Or sometimes you'll see a lot of changes in heart structure in the context of rheumatic heart disease as well. Uh, another thing to be very mindful of in patients is the possibility of device infection. Now, here's a person uh, with uh, an insertion for a pulse generator with a lot of redness around the site in multiple locations. And here's a little spot even where it looks like there's even a tract, a communication tract between the pocket and the surface. And it's very important to be mindful of infection of uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices, um, knowing full well that if you have evidence of, of a pocket infection or infection of the leads, you know, with endocarditis or both, the only effective treatment uh, per the guidelines is to extract the system. And there's certain high risk bugs like. Uh, uh, Staph aureus, for example, um, that you need to be very mindful of uh, for prompt extraction of these systems. So thank you very much for your attention today. It's great to be able to talk with all of you. I appreciate that a lot of the content in today's session was basic. It was intended to be so. Um, if you have feedback or other specific topics that you want to hear about, um, please let me know. I'm happy to offer materials that are useful to the group. Today's session is really an introduction uh, for all of us. And I want you to know that I don't have any specific topics that I quote unquote want to present. Rather, the only thing I want to present is the kind of thing that you feel would be useful to you. Uh, so with that, I'll pause and I'd like to take questions uh, if anybody in the group has them and has time for them. Well, thank you, Dr. Patazek, yep. for such a great um, presentation. Um, EJ Maikero here. Um, I just wanted to go back to um, Dr. Okunoga. She had asked a question about one of the slides that you had done um, a little bit further back. And so I was wondering if we could go back there. Yeah, which one is it? Um, it was the one about failure to sense in the... Um, DDD. Yeah. 
I no, I, I I went too far. Yeah. I think Oh this one. Is it this one? I'm confused now if it's this one or the other one. Dr. Kunaga, are you still there? Do you know which one you were talking about? Is it this one? I think it's this one. Yeah. So um, she was mentioning that there were some PAs. Well, I guess, could you go step by step through this um, EKG and just kind of, um, you know, explain again for her? Yeah, sure. So here's sinus rhythm. There's no pacing spike here, just P waves. But every time you see, for these first four beats, every time you see a P wave, you see a pacing spike in a QRS complex. So it's atrial sensing ventricular pacing. Then you've got a P wave that it comes in pretty much on time with the earlier ones, right? So you have uh, actually two things happening here, uh, only one of which I highlighted earlier for the sake of simplicity. But... Um, so it's failure to, so you've got this atrial beat, right? And no response afterwards. And also no ventricular pacing, even though it timed out. So not only is it failure to sense on the atrial channel, but it's also failure to sense on the ventricular channel, because if you were sensing the ventricular channel appropriately, in this circumstance, you would have expected a V pacing event to come in, but it didn't. Right. Um, and the next event that you have is atrial pacing with successful uh, capture and ventricular pacing with successful capture. And it's noteworthy that uh, in this case, nowhere in the tracing do we see failure to capture where there's pacing that's actually delivered. What you see, though, is just the failure to sensing mostly to atrial events. And when that one case here where you have absence of ventricular pacing, even though there was no ventricular signal and you would have expected that the, the device would have stepped in. So Dr. Okunoga, does that explain your question? Okay, um, good evening, Ma. good evening. Sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee and Dr. Ijama. So my, my challenge is that um, so I understand the first four um, EKGs. Um, we could see atrium, there's no spike. So atrial sensing, ventricle, there's a spike before it. So ventricular pacing. So, but the fifth one is the P wave. We can see the P wave. I don't know. It's, it's maybe just a bit too close to the T wave. So you feel that and there's no QRS. So here, um, so even though we can see P wave, are we saying that there's no atrial sensing despite that we can see a P wave? And um, so, so I think I can see a P wave. So I'm thinking there's atrial sensing. Is it because it's, it's closer than the other three ECGs? That's why the other QRS, that's why we say it's not um, sensing. So, so, so my question is, I think there's atrial sensing, but no ventricular sensing and pacing then it goes on and i can see atrial pacing so not atrial sense atrial pacing and ventricular pacing so i'm thinking when we set the pacemaker so i'm very new in this thing i just want to understand so when we set um, a pacemaker maybe we set it to the um, 60 beats per minute so that anytime it goes below that, that's when it should pace. So I come in the same ECG. So I know that it's DDD, the ventricle is either sensing or pacing. So what determines when the ventricle paces, like the first four, the atrium senses, it doesn't pace. And then by the fifth um, QRS, the P way before it is pacing. So what determines when it senses and pacing in um, like, like a run like this? And then why did we say the fourth ECG that is showing a P wave that it did not sense, um, despite that we can see a P wave? And how did if the fact that we, could, we cannot see a QRS, um, is, is, does it mean, so we cannot see a QRS, so does it mean absence of sensing and pacing? So because I think that if we don't see a QRS, um, okay, if we don't see a QRS with a spike, that means there's no there's sensing. If there's a spike, there's pacing. So once we don't see it at all, so it doesn't mean that both sensing and um, pacing of the ventricle is absent. 
And then the final thing is, again, the P wave. Why did we say that there's no sense in that spider is there, even though it's closer to the T wave than the other ones? Thank you. Okay. Sure. So I think it's just two examples of two different things, failure of sensing on the atrial and the ventricular channel leading to two different manifestations. So here, this is native sinus rhythm, and the, and the PP intervals are fairly constant. So this one, even though it looks like it's a little closer to the T wave, as you originally pointed out, it's not necessarily any closer than the other ones would have been. And it's just that this one is not associated with the expected pacing event uh, in the ventricle. And so it looks like there's failure to sense in the ventricular channel, because even though this atrial event happened, you would have expected that the, you know, the, the, the atrial, the, the, the AV synchrony to have kicked in, right? And the ventricle in would have been paced in response to sensed sensing event in the atrium. But not only do you not have apparent sensing of the atrial event, you also have no, no clear evidence that you had proper sensing in the ventricular channel because you would have expected that uh, if the device detected appropriately the absence of um, the ventricular signal, native ventricular signal, it would have stepped into pace and it didn't, right? And that's distinct from what we're seeing on the right side of the tracing where you see this P wave and almost immediately thereafter, you have got atrial pacing, right? And certainly, you know, the, this person has not been set to pace at a rate of, you know, 200 beats per minute, you know? And so the presence of an atrial pacing spike so soon after uh, a native atrial wave is an indicator of failure to pace there. So it's, if I had to summarize it in one sentence, it's failure to sense in both chambers. I hope that clarifies it. But every now and again, something funky will happen and you may not have a perfect, just know that in the for the future, you may not have a perfect explanation for what's happening on every beat every time. But certainly we're seeing a lot of evidence here as you go across the tracing of inappropriate sensing. And it's often the case that a lot of these things are going to happen at once. So you may have uh, you may have evidence of failure to capture along with failure to sense in a lot of these folks. And so the question is then like, okay, here's this atrial sensing event and a V pacing spike is atrial sensing. And, you know, is there a V pacing spike here? There actually isn't, you know, there wasn't one delivered. It's, and I appreciate it. It's, it's really tough to see on this, um, on this photocopy, but, they're unlike the other cases in the original, at least, where you were able to see a clear pacing spike that didn't line up with the grid lines on the paper. Here, there was no additional pacing spike delivered. So there was no, so there was no evidence of true failure to capture here. There was just failure to sense. I hope that clarifies it. Yeah, and I think that um, another thing to mention, and, you know, we've kind of talked about this, but sometimes, you know, it's it's quite easy if it's a single chamber, right? If it's a single chamber pacer, it's less complicated. You just have one chamber to deal with. You only have one clock or timer to deal with. Mm -hmm. But when you have a dual chamber um, or even a biventricular, um, you know, basically a dual chamber and atrium and a ventricle, um, then you have multiple different things to think about. And your timers really depend on not just what's happening in one chamber, but also how it relates to the other chamber. So in this particular situation, you kind of don't only think about what's happening in the atrium, but also what should happen in the ventricle as a result of what happened in the atrium. And that's where the failure to sense comes in. So yes, it looks like it's not pacing, but if you look at every um, QRS, you know, even though like Dr. Patazek said, 
it wasn't, you know, it's not the greatest um, picture, but if you look at every QRS, there is a spike in front of it. Um, and so every time it's supposed to capture the ventricle, it's it does capture the ventricle. But in this particular case, you actually don't even see a spike. So the only reason why you wouldn't see a spike going to the ventricle is because whatever would have initially set it off didn't do that in this particular case. So the only thing that could have happened here is the fact that it didn't see that P wave. And that's where, yeah. you know, this is now a failure to sense. So um, I know I, I basically repeated what Dr. Patel No, no, that's really well put. That's really put. That's really well put. Well, I and guess. No, you, you, raise, you raise a key point that I didn't. No, so thank you for doing that. That's really helpful. Uh, and I hope it provided additional clarification. And sometimes, you know, it's a matter of just what data you've got, right? Sometimes you've just got the tracing that somebody puts in front of your face. It's not always the case that you've got the programmer in front of you, right? Where you can like see not just, you know, these these pieces of data, which as you mentioned, are, are sometimes by definition incomplete, right? But with the programmer, you can see what the device is thinking as well with these things, right? So you can see what's on the clock and on which channel, and you can then get a better sense of what that behavior was all about. But it's not always possible. Uh, and, and as you rightfully pointed out, the only thing that we can say for sure here is that we've got failure of sensing, not just on the atrial channel, but also on the ventricular channel as well, because it should have stepped in, right? All right, any other questions? Well, if you're like me at the beginning of my EP fellowship, when I heard a lot of this, my head would ache and I would go back and look at it and read things again. So um, I think everybody's just taking everything in. <laughs> look, I mean, for what it's worth, sometimes my head still aches. <laughs> I don't think that part ever goes away completely. And, and I think that, you know, in fairness, it's, it's one of the toughest things is when somebody puts a tracing in front of you and you're trying to, and you're trying to figure it out. And so, again, there's so many things that we could do. And again, my only goal here is to provide something that's, that the group decides is valuable, right? But one of the things that I think is, is, you know, super helpful, the, one of the things that I was the most thankful for in my own training is that I had mentors who would go through these unknown tracings with me and kind of go through the process of interpretation. Mm -hmm. I personally found that the most valuable, but again, I defer to all of you to decide what you want to hear and what you want to see in the future. Yeah, th thank you so much, um, Dr. Pytazic. Sorry, thank you. That that was it. That was a brilliant presentation um, there. Um, I, I wanted to congratulate you because a lot of my some of my colleagues, work colleagues from Northampton General, that are mm -hmm. trainees are on this, um, both physiologists and and um, um, junior doctors as well are on this. So they will find is really really useful. So really thank thank you a lot for coming on to do this. Really well explained, like. Um, Dr. Ikuru said, um, very, very well presented um, and good enough for everybody to understand. So that's really, really good. I was wondering, though, if you could go over again, because I think I missed that part um, when you spoke about the isorhythmic AV dissociation, like treatment, and you were saying whether you needed pacemaker for it or not. And, and you went over a few medications like atropine, um, dopamine, isoproterinol mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, um, so if, if say, for instance, in, in Africa, um, in fact, we're, we're going on a mission soon in a few weeks' time to Kumase, which is the second big, biggest city in Accra, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. in Ghana, um, they don't have temporary wire piece yeah. ability there. So yeah. what they've been doing when people are rushed in with complete heart block and things, they've got, they transcutaneously pace them. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mention it at all, uh, but I should have. Um, and so, uh, you know, the standard is that if you have access to a temporary pacing wire, you know, like an endovascular system, that's what you should use because it's the most reliable and less painful, right, than the transcutaneous. But you use whatever you have. 
Um, and if it happens to be transcutaneous pacing, then so be it. Um, and it's certainly one of the things that you have to have available. Yeah. And and can you um go over like the settings? What recommendation rate and and output like current output would you would you put out? Because they don't know, they're not hundred percent sure about this. Yeah. So uh, in somebody who's hemodynamically stable and is doing okay, uh, you can put it on as a backup rate, uh, uh, lower than the native rate, just to make sure that if they have a pause, they're protected. In terms of outputs for a temporary wire, that's determined during the procedure. So you'll determine the capture threshold during the procedure, and you'll give yourself a safety margin of like let's say five x, you know, current uh, excess to make sure that you've got capture. Um, regarding the transcutaneous right. systems, um, again, with regard to the pacing rate, same thing applies. If the person has a native rate and they're relatively hemodynamically stable, you can leave them alone and just set the rate to be lower than that, just to make sure they're protected from pacing. And it's especially important with transcutaneous systems because they're painful for patients to use them as little as possible, you know, especially if you're not able to sedate them very safely, right? Because if the person's hemodynamically not all that stable and you don't wanna be lowering their blood pressure any further, maybe tougher to give them medications to sedate them. So having them in backup modes um, with a rate lower than their native rate can be helpful. But if you've got somebody with a very low heart rate, less than 30 beats per minute and or evidence of hemodynamic instability, then I just set the rate at 60, you know, for the native physiologic rate. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you. Not at all. Not at all. Well, again, thank you all for inviting me to join you. This is great. I, I hope that um, we have the opportunity to meet again in the near future. And thank you for being patient with me with my uh, audio visual challenges at the beginning. Um, and uh, again, uh, if you have any feedback about today's session or any feedback regarding potential content that you'd like to see covered in future sessions, uh, please let me know, uh, because again, the only goal here is to provide you with content that you decide is helpful. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Leon. Thank you so much. Well discussed thank you. and well understood. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Thank you. Yes, sir. Have a good really day. Thank you very it. much.